this the title of this evening's talk just so those know what they're letting themselves in for this evening <laughs> it's uh most of the talks which I give here are by request and before I went off to Singapore a couple of weeks ago somebody actually asked me to please talk again about the subject of reincarnation so today's talk will be about rebirth, reincarnation I know I've talked about that many times before especially in my previous life but now <laughs> but this talk will be reincarnated again this evening this is a reincarnation of the talk on reincarnation there's still a few people coming in so and those of you who are going out don't worry you'll hear this talk <laughs> in the next life It'll be reincarnated on CD, <laughs> thanks to our wonderful technical people somewhere. Okay, yeah, and most people are coming in, going out. I love talking about that subject because it's part of Buddhism, and it's not just a theory, it's something you can prove. It's something which many, many people feel extremely comfortable about, and it's something which is almost like a cause for me to try and teach more about reincarnation so that it will actually change many of the ways we look at life. In particular, sometimes that I tear my hair out sometimes, that's why I'm so bald as a monk, about what people do as the most important thing. The biggest problem for most people is a matter of life and death. And for a Buddhist, it's not a matter of life and death anymore because how many times you've lived, how many times you've died, it actually puts many of the things which we look at in our world in a completely different perspective. And some of the reasons why we take action or inaction have a completely different meaning when we look upon reincarnation and take that as an, a natural truth, as a guideline for our lives. So this is not just a theoretical talk, but the consequences of the understanding and acceptance of reincarnation literally change not just your life, but many lives. <laughs> so you've got to go down to the start of things. It's strange that many people say that reincarnation is an Eastern idea. But anyone who knows history knows that all of the Greek philosophers, they were all into reincarnation where there was you know, the famous ones of you know, Socrates and Plato and Pythagoras, they were all into reincarnation. They taught previous lives, so did Empedocles, Heraclitus, all these great philosophers. The reason I mention this is because if you ever read about sort of you know, Western governments or Western um, intelligentsia, they keep on always saying that they got their culture from Greece and that somehow the Greek culture is somehow different than sort of Eastern culture. But you know, we took a look at that particular time, and there was hardly much difference. Certainly all the Greeks believed in reincarnation. It just got dropped uh, in about the 3rd century AD by the Christians, and they just made it anathema, and then it just got wiped out. But the truth is that that was part of Western culture as much as it was part of Eastern culture. And you can't just wipe those things out. Socrates and Plato, they keep getting reborn again and just teaching the same things. And it's interesting that one of the proponents of reincarnation in Christianity, perhaps the most famous of them, the early church father called Origen, he taught reincarnation as part of Christianity. And perhaps one of the most interesting things about that fellow, that he had a teacher and then couldn't really tell exactly who was this teacher guy because they had no other records of him in uh, Alexandria in Greece in the Middle East of that time in the heart of European culture. You know who Origen's teacher was? It was a fellow called Ammonius Saka. That might sound strange to you until you realise i just come back from Singapore and there, as many of you would know, the surname, the family name, comes first in their name. So if you say, you know, like a person called Han Henry Chan, in Singapore they call him Chan Henry. Same with Greek. If you turn that name around, 
instead of ammonia sakka. And sakka is the sand, the party form of sakya. Instead of ammonia sakya, sakya ammonia. What does that sound like? All of you who are Buddhists, you know that that's a dead ring of a sakya muni, one of the epithets, the name by which the Buddha is well known by. Very clear to me, anyway. The early church father, his teacher, was a Buddha. Sakya Muni. Anyway, whatever the people actually believed in reincarnation in the very early part. Of, unfortunately, we, Western culture actually took that completely out of their religions and out of their culture. And I think we've uh, we suffered for it as a result. Because once we only have the idea of one life, and that's all we have, you can imagine the justified uh, angst and grief when, say, a little child dies. They've only got one chance and they've blown it. They got killed by somebody who was mean, cruel, or whatever. It might have been an accident. But how unlucky they've had one chance at a life and they've only had a few years. No wonder the parents feel grief. When one person has been growing up and they haven't had their full opportunity, that seems so sad. And where people actually try and live no matter what, that life becomes the most important thing, that life becomes sacred in and of itself. And because of the sacredness of life, you can see where many uh, people get their ethics from and their ethical problems as a result with things like abortion, euthanasia. Because if life is sacred, in other words, we've only got one chance of it, then the ethics become skewed. But if you can actually put the mind around many, many lives, then one death doesn't take on such a great importance anymore. If you don't get it right this time, you can get it right the next time. It's not as if, you know, why did that child have no chance? They have got a chance, another chance next time. Short lives, long lives, middle lives. We've had many, many lives. So that's just a taste of how the understanding or acceptance of reincarnation can actually change the way we look at life and death matters and about the idea of the sacredness of life. It's not the fact that you live long and a full life which is important in Buddhism. It's actually how one lives the life which becomes important. Quality of life, meaning of life, becomes far more important under the idea of reincarnation than just a death. A death becomes just an event, an event amongst many other events rather than a finality. When death becomes a finality, the death becomes an extreme and then we do get extremist ethical positions against abortion, against euthanasia or whatever. And we get great grief, we get great sadness, we want to live at any cost. So this is actually one of the problems. The belief in reincarnation, if it was uh, held to by the majority of people, would change the way we live. Just you know, easy things like about the care of the environment, global warming. If every politician who was alive today knew they were going to come back and actually have to uh, live with the consequences of their policies, wouldn't they have a greater incentive of looking after this planet when they know they're going to have to come back here and live in it? Wouldn't it be more important for them to look on a big picture and not just the next election, but know their next birth? Wouldn't it be important to do so? So you can see there's great consequences of people accepting the idea of rebirth. But people keep on saying that, well, where's the proof? Where's the evidence? Because one nice thing about Buddhism as a religion, that it says you don't believe unless you can prove, unless the evidence is out there. And one of my sort of uh, complaints is, look, there is heaps of evidence out there. You just have to go and look for it. But those people who don't look for the evidence, just like some of our politicians who don't actually look for the evidence of the abuse in the prisons in Iraq. It's there on their table. They just don't look for it. It's similar, isn't it, that sometimes 
We don't actually look and it's there because we don't want to see it. But the evidence is there. Many people, in our, even in Australia, have spontaneous memories of their previous lives. And these aren't crazy people. And their memories are actually affirmed by the relations and loved ones. They get knowledge of things which happen which could not have, they could not have got from elsewhere. Sometimes they're spooky, and if ever you've come across someone who's remembered their past life and that past life has been in your family, you become convinced. Because the evidence is just so overwhelming. For anyone who wants to check out the evidence as a scientist, as a rational person, as a free thinker, a free thinker, like any freedom, has to have its responsibilities, and you should look at the truth, look at what's actually out there, what the evidence truly is. You all know we have those beautiful books by Dr. Ian Stevenson, Professor Ian Stevenson, who spent his whole life researching such cases, and it'd be good to look at those cases. Well-researched, honest, great science, in the sense that he put all of the uh, controls in place to make sure that nothing would be written which would, could be challenged on its authenticity by having witnesses available. And there you have unimpeachable evidence of reincarnation. And some of you may have anecdotal evidence. There's many, many strange stories of people who remember their past lives. And what happens when you do that? I don't know the last time I gave a talk on reincarnation, but there are many fascinating stories of people who remember their past lives. There's one of the great cases I came across was this person in Sydney whose aunt was a wealthy businesswoman. When she died, she got reborn. There's this Buddhist, his name is Trevor, has his daughter. Everybody, when the baby was born, came out to look, oh, doesn't that look like your aunt? And it was his aunt. Many, many recollections came to that little baby. Remember when he was telling me this, the two recollections which I remember was when this little he came in to his into his lounge room or whatever with a cup of coffee and the baby just went berserk saying, Daddy, give me my cup back. That's my cup, not yours. It was his aunt's cup. He would inherited it. Going crazy when they got anywhere near the mansion in which he used to live. Her recall was so great that the whole family accept the fact that that was his aunt, now reborn as his daughter. I mention that story because it shows that rebirth very often happens in the same families. There's a karmic connection, a craving, a love, attachment, if you like, which actually brings us close to people we used to love before. There's another, so I'm just scanning to make sure this lady is not here this evening, but there's a, another lady, a Thai lady, who was in, born in the northeast of Thailand. And she recalled her previous life. Her son from her last life was her uncle in this one. She died quite young in a previous life. And now her uncle her son from the previous life, happened to be the headmaster at the school where she went for four years. At those times in Thailand, in, Thailand, in the northeast, those schools were very strict. When the teacher walked in, everyone had to stand up. And if anyone did anything wrong, they'd get the cane. Now, imagine this young girl going to school for the first time. Her recollection of her previous lives was so clear that everyone in the village knew. In her previous life, she was the, the teacher's father. And the teacher knew that that little girl was his mother, reborn. So when the teacher came in, everyone stood up, except this little girl. How could you stand up for your son? He said, son, just stand up for him. I'm, I'm your mum said this little six-year-old. And how could the teacher you know, hit your mum and punish your mother? <laughs> you just can't do this. 
And so this lady who said she, she didn't learn anything in school, not much. She, she could do whatever she wanted. The teacher couldn't punish her because she was the rebirth of his mum. <laughs> it's a very difficult situation, but that's a true story. There's many stories like that. Even some famous people. One interesting case which I read because it was an interesting case because I knew this man. He was actually a personality, a TV personality, a comedian in the UK called Roy Hudd. Anyone who's uh, about my age who grew up in England would probably know him. He was on the television very often. Roy Hudd, H-U-D-D. On the way back from a theatre one afternoon, he lost his way in London. He got lost. He turned down a street not knowing where he was going. But as soon as he went down that street, just like many people sometimes experience, goosebumps, hairs on the back of your head, something strange coming, coming up. As he turned down that street, he saw the house where he lived in his previous life. And in that just recognition, huge amounts of memories came back. He remembered his previous life as he stumbled across the house in which he'd lived many years before. He knocked on the door of that house, and because he was a well-known personality, they were quite surprised. They knew who he was straight away. And when he said who, who he had been, he took the owners of the house on a guided tour around a house he'd never been in before in this life. And he wrote a little article about it. Perhaps the most interesting part of that story in many houses in London, if any of you have been to that city, you'll find little blue metal circles put on houses where famous people have lived before. That house had such a circle. The house recognised this previous owner, him in his previous life. In his life before, he had been a person called Dan Leno, who was one of the most famous music hall entertainers. He was an entertainer in his previous life by the name of Dan Leno. I knew a bit about English Music Hall. And now he died, got reborn, and was an entertainer again called Roy Hudd. Fascinating examples. And if you have a chance to talk to such people, they would affirm without any shadow of doubt that that was them. For them it's clear. For them it's true because they have their clear memories and their memories are confirmed time and time and time again. Some of you might know someone who's had memories of a past life and they'll be so sure that yes, that was them. And the point is, if one person can do that, and there's more than one, if there's 20, 30, 100, 200 people in this world who can prove that they lived before, isn't it not reasonable to say we've all lived before. We've all been reborn. Most of us can't remember. We can't even remember that we were born. Sometimes people actually ask you. It's one of the questions they ask to try and challenge the idea of rebirth, is that if we were reborn, why can't we remember it? And the answer is, can you remember your own birth into this world? How many people can remember the moment they were born, they came out of their mother's womb? Just because you can't remember it didn't mean it didn't happen. In the same way, it's because of our lack of memory skills. That's why most of us can't recall our past births. But there are other indications, our character traits. Where did they come from? If anyone who's had a baby would know that that baby is not the father, it's not the mother, it's not a combination of the two. It comes from somewhere else. Parents know this. It has strange actions. When I was in Singapore just the last week, someone told me of a spooky experience. Imagine if this happened to you. The baby had just been born after one or two days. It didn't say how long, but in the first week, the mother had lying on the bed, had the baby on top of her, just lying on her stomach, and the baby sat up and folded its legs in full lotus, as if it was meditating, I mean really meditating. That really spooked the mum. I never taught it to do that.
Now, those characters, you've probably seen that in sort of documentaries about people who can play the piano perfectly. They never had any, not even one lesson. Where did all that come from? The evidence is so compelling, you have to actually be very, very stubborn not to accept that there are beings here who have certainly lived before. And if they have, why not you? And if that's the case, you've lived before. Is this your only life? Are you going to live again? And again, there's so much scientific evidence that consciousness does survive death. That famous article which I keep referring to in the Lancet, Journal of the American Medi- the British Medical Association, only about three or four years ago, by Professor Pim Van Rommel, titled Consciousness Survives Death, who actually showed that People with near-death experiences, what I call out-of-the-body experiences, floating out of their body on the operating table and coming back and describing the procedures and the conversations of what happened at a certain time. And it's very easy for the nurses or doctors to confirm that those things actually did happen. What is fascinating is that they could describe the medical procedures. And if any of you have seen a documentary or actually been... Well, no, sometimes you have these operations under local anaesthetic. You're lying on the back there. You can't see what's going on over here. Very often you've got a mask over your face. But these people could actually see a literally a bird's eye view of the operation. It could only be seen as if you were floating above in a position where you could actually have the only view possible to describe those procedures. Time and time again, people describe these things. So this doctor, Professor Pim Van Rommel, decided to do some research on this and found that all the cases where people had out-of-the-body experiences and could describe in accurate detail conversations, actions, medical procedures which were done at this time, all of those people, what he actually found, one of the most amazing part of that research, put in the British Medical Association Journal of the Lancet, were at that time... People were dead. They were under cardiac arrest. The heart was not beating, and most importantly, they were brain dead. The brain was not working. There was no brain activity whatsoever. It couldn't have been in imagination. It couldn't have been some um, thing just causing the brain, because at that time, they were brain dead. They were revived afterwards. The EEG was flat. Fascinating little piece of evidence there. And that's why he said, look, they were conscious at the time. There was no brain activity. They were uh, clinically dead. Therefore, consciousness does survive death. As many of us know it survives death. Anyone who's seen a ghost knows that consciousness survives death. And there are many ghost stories. I'm not going to tell the ghost stories now, but only just as as an aside... When in the conference I just came back from in Singapore last weekend, one of uh, the Western monks, some of you might remember, Venerable Sujato, he is from Perth, and he was uh, now in our monastery in Sydney, what, Santi, and he was doing a little presentation on, on Buddhist ideas of life and death, and he couldn't resist telling a couple of ghost stories. But over there in this conference, they had all the special effects. <laughs> so... <laughs> Sol was there at the time. So when he started telling his ghost stories, all the lights went down. They had a dry ice machine sending clouds of smoke on the stage. And through the speakers came this this background music, which you hear on, um, ghost, uh, on uh, ghost movies. And of course, everyone cracked up laughing. No one could take such things seriously, but real ghost stories are serious, and many people have seen ghosts. If you haven't seen one yourself, you probably know a friend, someone you can trust, who has seen them. How can that be unless there is life after death or consciousness survives death? Even just being cheeky, because I'm a great friend with um, Abbot Placid. He's the, um, the head of the Benedictine Monastery in New Norcia, they go and visit, come and visit us once a year. We go and visit him once a year. And we're very great friends. And I was very cheeky once. And I said, oh, when he was in New Norcia, this very, very old monastery, are there any ghosts in here? Do you believe in ghosts? 
And he said, because in the Catholic tradition, he said, no, no, we don't believe in ghosts. What about the Holy Ghost then? Ha, <laughs> ha, caught you out. <laughs> he was just laughing. He knows me and I know him. <laughs> but there are such things as ghosts, and many people have actually seen them. It's life surviving death. There are heavenly beings as well, Davids, and there's other stories about those which I've told here on other occasions. So if there are those beings there, how can they exist? Human beings who got reborn into those states. Here's a good story about rebirth. This was actually one of the monks, who, Thai monks, who comes here every now and again. It was a story of the monkey who got reborn as a human being. Because in the, you know that in um, Buddhist monasteries, the, mo the monks are very compassionate. And uh, you know, it's one of our important parts of being a Buddhist is kindness to animals. And so in some parts of Thailand, that whenever sometimes they see like an animal who's being mistreated, like a monkey who's being put in a cage, just used as a pet, and very often like kind people would buy that monkey and actually give it to the monastery to look after, because thinking that such monkeys can't actually live and survive in the wild, and at least in the monastery they'd have, the forest monasteries had freedom actually to roam around, and number two, the monks would look after and protect them, they'd be safe from hunters. So one day this person, they, they found this monkey being mistreated, they really badly mistreated, and they brought it and took it to a monastery, and they released it in this forest monastery. I've been there quite a, a couple of times. And of course this monkey soon, because of the, all the monks were really, really kind, would actually look after the monks, and was quite friendly with them. It's very, very cute. Because you know, every afternoon when the monks had their tea time, the monkey also had to have his cup of tea, and he would hold his tea just like this, with all the little monks sitting there on the stool, and every now and again, sipping his tea. Really cute to see. <laughs> but the monkey was also very intelligent, and sometimes these people would come and actually uh, visit the monastery, like people visit our monastery down at Serpentine, or visit Sister's Monastery up in Gijiganup. And when they visit, they'd ask questions, and some people were cheeky with the monks. And if any person was cheeky with this monk, the senior monk, the monkey would actually get them. What he would do, he'd go to the first person, and it was this really nice monkey, and he's just really so soft and playful, and people would stroke the monkey, and the monkey would just you know, smile or do what monkeys do when they're having a good time. And then he'd go to the next person in line, and they'd also pet him and stroke him. It was really nice. I mean, people like um, stroking pets, especially when they're nice and soft. Then you go to the next person. When they get to the person who is cheeky, they go to pet him and he bite them to teach them a lesson that you shouldn't be cheeky with the monks. <laughs> and they always know which one to bite. <laughs> and that's the monkey. And unfortunately, it had been so many of these cheeky people. <laughs> well, the abbot thought, no, look, we, we can't keep it in the monastery. So he told the second monk, to go and take the monkey to a, a nature reserve. And that's where they took it. And it was like a nature reserve. It was actually on an island in the middle of a lake, which was uh, protected. So they let the monkey go there. The monkey never wanted to go. You could see he was really depressed all day. And they let him there, and they rode away. And one week later, this monk has you know, he's got his meditation together, got psychic powers realized that the monkey was not going to survive and was very, very lonely and very upset. So he sent the second monk to go back to the island and get the monkey back. There's this big, huge nature reserve. How did you find the monkey? All he did, he went there and he just called out. And one, mo one minute, that's all it took, and this monkey came flying through the trees and straight into this monk's arms and sort of gave him a big hug. And so they took him back to the monastery. But on the boat, on the way back... The monkey bit the monk. Only not very hard, but just to say, don't do that again. <laughs> and so he spent the rest of his life in the monastery. But again, like the monkey like, was always very protective. And so one day he actually chased a truck because we were making a noise outside the monastery. And unfortunately he got, got killed. Got run over by the truck. But what happened next when that monkey died... The abbot actually told what happened because he saw it in his meditation. He saw the stream of consciousness from that monkey go off into the village. 
there was a woman who was pregnant. He saw that monkey enter that woman's womb. A few months later, her baby was born, a son, who was uncommonly hairy. <laughs> He was a monkey reborn. He made it into being a human being. And that's a true story. And of course, uh, you know, the monks like you know, like myself or you know, Ajahn Yana, he was the one who told me that story. That monks, you know, we can't keep good stories uh, to ourselves. We tell everybody. So I'm sure that's gone all around the village. And we really felt very sorry for that young boy because when he goes to school and someone says, you, you're a little monkey, it's actually true. <laughs> He was a monkey in his past life. <laughs> so any of you who like bananas, that may have been you. <laughs> but the point is, that these are like evidence of actually rebirth. And it's, the evidence is out there. And we have inclinations which actually go from life to life. And I've already mentioned that Roy Hudd. Inclination, he was a comedian before, he became a comedian in his next life. Maybe not quite as famous. It's credible just how our inclinations, if we're doctors or nurses, we tend to go to those fields again. This is how we actually take our karma from time to time. That lady who was uh, uh, that uh, daughter of Trevor in uh, Sydney, she was a very big businesswoman before. She's a big businesswoman now. When? She was very young. He told me that they went past his sign on the side of the tollway. It was an advertisement by the New South Wales government about some sort of tax. And this little girl, only two years of age, asked Daddy, what does the word tax mean? And Daddy tried to explain to a two-year-old what it means, what the concept of tax is. And he said, no, darling, when you get any pocket money, you have to give some to the government. And she said, a two-year-old, when I get any money, Daddy, I'm giving nothing to no government. Because mm. as a businesswoman, she hated paying her taxes. In her previous life, she was well known for it. That inclination carried on into this life. So some of the inclinations you have, some of your talents, some of your likes, preferences, where did they come from? Are they the same as your mother's or father's? Isn't it obvious you were born before? For those of you who want even more direct proof, this is why we teach meditation. And I've said this in my meditation retreat. Sometimes you can go so deep in your meditation, you can recall your past lives. And I love to teach people this, to give them direct evidence of what actually happens. If you can't actually get those direct memories of your previous life, at least you can understand how the whole process works. You know the process of dying? You should do. You've done it many times before. It's very similar to actually what happens in deep meditation. Your body is being dropped away. Your five senses of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching are turning off. That's exactly what we do in meditation. We let go of our body. We uh, allow sight, smell, so sight, hearing, smell, taste, touch, physical body to completely disappear. So the mind becomes manifest. Many of you, if you haven't experienced it yourself, you've heard me talk about it or read it in my books, that we talk all about nimitas, this beautiful light which appears in the mind when all the five senses have been quelled, where you can't hear anything, see anything, you can't even feel anything in your body anymore. The five senses have completely stopped. That's when you get these nimitas, these lights arising in your mind. And what happens when people have out-of-the-body experiences? <laughs> Floating towards the light. Same thing happens in death as you do in meditation. And if you can get that nimitta coming up in meditation, that's the light, it's called a nimitta. If you can experience that many, many times, you'll get the understanding that that's when you've got your body's completely fallen away, you have no five sense activity at all. You're understanding what it's like to die. You're preparing, training, practicing, 
And that's what will happen to you when you pass away. And when you understand this, you can actually feel, you understand that this is actually what happens when you go into those realms of mind. You know they're completely independent of the body. The body can die. And that mind, that stream of consciousness will carry on. It has to. You can see it. It's just obvious. The mind will continue. And that mind will seek its next rebirth according to one, its karma, and two, according to its craving desires where you want to go. Sometimes some people actually ask me, can you actually get, as a human being, get reborn as an animal? Of course you can if you really want to. Many people have come up to me and told me that in their next life they want to be reborn as a cat or a dog simply because they don't want to go to work on a Monday morning ever again. <laughs> they want to get fed wonderful food without having to cook it. They want to spend all day sleeping by the fire. <laughs> So people like that, you're going to get reborn as a little cat or a little dog. But make sure you get reborn as a cat or a dog in a good home or in a Buddhist monastery. Please don't get reborn as a cat or a dog outside a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> I think that's a bit of a... Anyway... <laughs> So you can go both up and down in in uh, in rebirth and reincarnation. But the once you've got the evidence and you've sorted it out for yourself, these things are true. Now imagine the consequences of that. And the consequences gives a whole different uh, idea to one's ethics and to this little time we have in this little life we call me. You realize this is much more to life than this wonderful existence of you know, 70, 80 years or 10 years or 50 years. People remember their past lives. It gives a completely different idea of what they're doing now. Why try and become wealthy? Why try and become famous? Why try and do all these stupid things when they know they've been there, they've done that, and that doesn't give them any real happiness anymore? Sometimes the people have to keep doing it again and again and again because they forget the lessons, not of history, they forget the lessons of their past lives. Because a lot of times we become wealthy or famous at the expense of others, at the expense of other people's well-being and happiness, at the expense of our children and family, at the expense of love and compassion. Once actually one has the full picture of what life is all about, of many, many lives, a completely different ethics starts to take place. That's where the law of karma becomes very evident as the most important way of guiding your life. It doesn't matter how long you live. The important part is how you live. I was just giving in Singapore. People were asking me all these questions about terrorism. What's the Buddhist response to terrorism? I say pacifism. We don't sort of have wars with anybody. We take the high moral stand. And even if we get blown up, I'd rather get blown up by a terrorist bomb. Because it's only one life. It's only a little death. You get reborn again. <laughs> it's not a big thing. It's much better to actually to hold up your principles of tolerance, of peace, of non-violence, of non-reaction. When we have the idea... Women and children are getting killed, young people. When life and death become the paramount, then our governments react to terrorism. They blow up a few people as if that's the most important thing, that they've invaded something sacred. They've destroyed something which we're not going to allow them ever to destroy again, life. It's good to try and preserve life. Human life is a very precious one. But there are other things more precious than a human life. The quality of life, the karma, that's far more precious. That's why people like Gandhi could actually say, I can see a thousand reasons to give my life for a cause, but I can't see one reason to take the life of another person. You can only say such things if you understand the truth of reincarnation. Otherwise, your one life is too important. That your life takes precedence. Your, your life becomes sacred, inviolable, 
the most important thing in the world. When you have rebirth, why do we try and keep people alive for such a long time when they have no quality of life at all? Wouldn't it be easier, better, even more ethical to let them go off into a new life? Why keep your old bomb of a car when you can get a new car almost immediately? Trade in with nothing to pay. We need to look at it that way. Some of the things we do in our society become really ridiculous. Some of the ways we look at life. I always say that if we believed in rebirths, we'd take much better care of our old people. The reasons why governments do not put many resources into the elderly because they think it's a waste of time. They're going to die anyway. What are old people going to do to our society? It's not an investment for our future. But imagine if our governments, the people who make these decisions on where the tax money goes, realise that those old people will be reborn as our children. That there is an investment in the future for looking after the elderly and give them a quality of life then wouldn't we mean we do put more money into looking after our seniors and our elderly people? I often say one of the great reasons we have trouble with our children, why children never do what we ask them, why children create so much problems in our world, is just our old people getting their own back for us not looking after them in their previous life. And that's what they're doing. That's why they're writing all this graffiti. They're upset at us because they weren't treated right before and they come back with this negativity, with this resentment, even revenge. Perhaps that's why. Perhaps why if we did look after our parents, our grandparents, the old people, in the old people's home, make them into beautiful places, put the resources in them. These are going to be young people in the future. Governments, even us, we're willing to sacrifice everybody for everything for children because we say the future is with our youth. In Buddhism, we say the future is with our old people. <laughs> now, can you see a different way of looking at things? That idea of rebirth, reincarnation actually gives you a completely different worldview. And it means we're not so attached to this one body of ours. Sometimes we're so attached to this body and this life, we get ourselves really screwed up inside our heads. And sometimes, you know, you may have an accident, you may lose part of this body, so it doesn't matter, you get another part another time. And it may be born ugly, especially ladies. Oh, ugly, I never get, there's one chance of a life, I'm born ugly, I can never get a sort of a good husband. Doesn't matter you were ugly before, next time you'll be beautiful, next time you'll be a supermodel, next time you'll be goodness knows what else. So isn't it marvellous when we see no we've got another chance? This one life is not all we've got. It's not so vitally important. I get what I've got, this is my only chance at it, I've got to get it. No wonder people get depressed. When we don't make out, we don't become the best, we think that's it, we've blown our chances, we can't do it anymore. Those people have middle-age crisis. You think life has passed you by. Your opportunities are no longer. It's gone. All of your hopes and dreams are no longer realisable. Wouldn't it make it more serene, more easy on you to know that you've got another chance next time? If you really want it. To know there is no such thing as absolute failure. We can always take the exam again if we really want to. We've got another chance, a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance, a many chance. Isn't it wonderful to tell people when they've lost a loved one at a funeral service and tell them not just because I want to make them feel good. Sometimes people do that, you know, priests, monks, we just say things just to make them happy. But it's without any honesty. I must admit that when I... My father's funeral, 
the one thing which I was upset about, not my actual father dying. I was very at peace with that, as I've said many times here and in other talks. But the one thing which really upset me in my father's funeral, I had this priest standing up there saying, oh, my father's such a good man. He was such a kind person. So what baloney, that man, that priest never even knew my father. My father wouldn't go near a church. That priest had good intentions because he wanted to say nice things, not to upset me. But because he wasn't being honest, he did upset me. I would prefer honesty. And so the funeral services, I try to be honest. And that's one of those honest things I can actually say at a funeral because of karma, because of attachment and craving. Very often you do see each other again because you want to, because you need to. That's why I can actually say if you lost a son or a daughter, chances are they are going to come back again. Not maybe as your son or daughter, because we actually change our relationships in families. People who remember past lives know that you may be a sister this life. Last time you were sort of a father. Last You changed genders as well. Now you understand why that some people actually were born in a male body, but they feel they're female. And sometimes people say that's some deviancy or some sort of psychological problem. It's not. It's just karma from the past. There was like a woman in a previous life. They'd been born in a, in a male body. Some of them still attaches to being a woman. Please be kind and compassionate, understanding what they're going through. It happens the other way around as well. A man in a previous life gets to be born as a woman. And they feel inside they've got a woman's body, but they feel male. Doesn't that un- give a, a really good understanding of where that's coming from? And if people could accept that, we'd be much kinder and compassionate, more compassionate to <laughs> same-sex marriages. Sometimes, because we think of one particular life, we become very, very narrow-minded, and that hurts many people. It actually creates so much suffering in the world. So that's why that I find it's a very important thing, this idea of reincarnation. And it means you're not so afraid of death anymore. You mean your own death. We're all going to die. Yes, everyone says that. We don't like to hear it. We don't like to see death. When anyone dies, we say, oh, isn't that sad? Why is it sad? That's why you know, I'm really rebellious. Someone says, oh, somebody's died. Oh, isn't it a shame? So why is it a shame? They're old, they're sick, they're worn out, they're going to get another body. Isn't it a wonderful thing? We've just actually got a, a new car for our monastery because our last one was crashed. It, it died at a young age. Our monastery van. Now we've got a new one. Isn't that a wonderful thing to have? So a new car. It's just been reincarnated. <laughs> <laughs> And the reason I say bad jokes like this is because I probably did the same in my previous life. Mm. <laughs> the point is that if we have an idea of reincarnation, we don't get so upset when somebody dies. They're just making a transition, that's all. It's not the end of the world when somebody dies. So that way our funerals can be actually more celebration of our life. In the same way where somebody graduates from school, you have a big celebration down in Watto or down the southwest somewhere. Hey, they finished the, the school, now they go to another stage of their life. Hey, now they've actually finished this human life, now they maybe have another stage of their life, maybe come back again, but isn't it a call for celebration? Why on earth do we cry? It's because in our heads we've got this idea, this is the only life. We've been brainwashed by Western society to think we have one life and that's it. We're materialist. We think the body is a be-all and end-all. We just actually pay no attention to people like Professor Pim Van Lommel, who says, no, consciousness survives death. It's something different than the brain and the body because the brain is not working. The body is stopped. And consciousness is there, provable. Shows how rebirth happens. Reincarnation is. I don't know if I've convinced you, but just imagine I have convinced you. Imagine what it would be like to know that this is not your first life. 
but it won't be your last life. Imagine how that changes the way you look at things. One life is not so important. Growing old is not so scary. Seeing other people die is no big deal. What becomes most important is actually how you're spending this day. When you go to sleep tonight, most of you will wake up in the morning. You have another day and another day. Any mistakes in this day, you can always have a chance to redeem them in the next day. It means this day becomes very important and vital for you. But it doesn't mean you get so upset. It softens the successes and failures in life. It doesn't make them just so huge and troublesome. Depression, anxiety, those things will be so lessened if we believed in rebirth. One of the problems that we have anxiety complex in our life, depressions, even to the point of suicides, I say is because we think there's only one life. We want to get rid of it. Only one life, let's get it over and done with. Quick. If you knew you had to come back again, what's the point of killing yourself? You have to come back again and do the same old thing. It doesn't make any sense anymore. So much of depressions, anxieties, fears, all these problems which are causing so much suffering in our modern world, many of those would be just ease if we could understand and look at the world through the ideal of many lives. That way, we're seeing things in a different perspective. It happens that it's a true perspective. Something which the Buddha taught, remembering his whole life, his past lives. Not just past lives as a human being, but past lives in other world cycles as well. Understanding that even this universe gets recycled, gets reborn, reincarnated, if you wish. In Buddhism, they were saying many, many world cycles. Planet Earth would eventually pass away and die. We care for it. We don't make it such a big deal. All those disaster movies, which I've been reading about in the papers, it's a big deal. Okay, just so New York gets, gets all wiped out by tornadoes or whatever it is. So what? People will build another sort of city, another universe somewhere else few hundred thousand million years in the future all goes round the cycles of existence this huge span of time which Buddhism embraces from the very beginning not changing these things to suit modern ideas but right from the beginning Buddhism taught this you know why? because it's a basic truth an underlying truth which never changes people have got too much energy for it to suddenly snuff out at the time of their death and that energy will seek new places, new places to assert itself, new places to explore the world, new places to experience. You can feel that, your life force, always going out, going on, traveling on, seeking more things, more places. When you die, you're not finished yet. Because you're not finished, you will go for another birth, another place, another life. As you will always do, until you find that you are finished. This is what rebirth means. And some of you, if you don't remember your past lives, at least you can understand. Maybe get a feel for the underlying truth of this. The evidence is out there, the evidence is also in here. And if we can take this on board, it will give us a new ethics for our life. A much kinder, compassionate, softer ethics. Less extreme. How can we hate anybody? Even somebody like Osama bin Laden. How can we hate them? We could have been their brother. They could have been our mother in a previous life. They made a mistake in this one. We can give them another chance in the next. So what? They've taken the lives of our brothers and sisters. All they've taken is their body, not their lives. Can you see how this softens, makes us more compassionate, so we don't get so hurt 
by things like death and sickness? What is death anyway? Just the death of a body, that's all. There's more to life than bodies. When one knows rebirth or reincarnation, then you know what I'm talking about. And then you know a different way of looking at life. A more peaceful, a more compassionate, a more forgiving. We can forgive. Because there's more time for forgiveness. There's many lives, not just one. So, there's a little talk about rebirth, reincarnation, whatever you wish to call it. And what happens, and how it happens, and how it can change our world. It is a different way of looking, a different way of caring. So, thank you very much for listening. Has anyone got any questions? Please ask them now. Otherwise, you'll have to wait till your next life. Yes. Yeah, go on. Okay, I remember um, looking at a TV documentary done some years ago called Reincarnation Experiments when some ladies were being hypnotized. And one in particular, under hypnosis, could speak perfect French without any accent. And you know, they put it on the TV. And actually, and I could uh, speak French when I was young. And it was excellent French. And they tested it out with other people, you know, with uh, French speakers, native French speakers. Perfect, accurate French. But she could only speak under hypnosis. She never learned French in her life, never been out of Australia before. It was fascinating that she was remembering a past life as a French aristocrat many years ago. Sometimes with those memories which sometimes we can't access in our normal consciousness. Sometimes we need hypnosis or we need meditation or, in your case, sleep to actually to take down those barriers which block our memory from the past. Some of them are self-imposed barriers. But if you can take down those barriers, then yes, sometimes you can recall traces of that past. Sometimes people can talk in languages they've never learnt. I saw that on that uh, documentary. I think the documentary is actually even in our library. You put it in there some time ago. Perhaps that's you. The interesting thing is actually to get someone to, to tape you while you're asleep. I mean, not to use as blackmail. I mean, more to actually to find out... <laughs> to actually to find out what you're saying, find out what language it is, and see if you can find out any details of that place that time it's fascinating that even if people have clear memories sometimes you know, they doubt too much and think what's that really me and then they go back to those places and they found those people and those places actually existed and one of those on that documentary well, the one which convinced me the most is four ladies they chose and one was uh, again a lady who'd never been out of Australia in her life check that out with the passport office she remembered her previous life as a man. She was a woman in this life, as a doctor in the town of Blagari in Scotland. It's interesting because our local doctor in Byford is from Blagari. And we told him, when I, he told me he was from Blagari, he said, that's interesting, we showed him the movie. I had been in Scotland many, many times when I grew up. I never remembered a town called Blagari. Maybe Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen, the big cities. But this lady in Australia had never been there. She remembered a Bulgari, there was such a town. In the 19th century, she even remembered her name as a doctor, James Archibald Burns. Burns is a common name, James is. But actually, Archibald is very uncommon. To get the three names all in line as a doctor in that time, in Bulgari, in Scotland, there'd only be one doctor there. The point was that if there was a doctor by that name at that time, they should be able to find out, because there were records. So they went there, they went to the public library, looked up the old records from that time. Dr. James Archibald Burns, Dr. James Archibald Burns, Dr. James Archibald Burns, not once, many, many times, in the documents which they kept from that time. There was a doctor called James Archibald Burns. 
a Bulgari in Scotland at the time this lady in somewhere outside Sydney remembered. Very, very convincing. So, see who you were. See if you left a will. <laughs> You're worth a lot of money now. <laughs> Test it out. Another question in the back? Yeah? Okay, you're asking sort of uh, how does rebirth happen? Is there a, a space between? The space, can it can be immediate, it can be after many days, it can be after many years before there's a rebirth. So there's no fixed rule. For, yeah, but I say that because um, in Theravada Buddhism, which is what I'm supposed to be part of, but I keep arguing, and no matter what part of Buddhism you're part of, you can argue with the whole lot. And I don't mind arguing with one of some of these senior, especially Sri Lanka monks, who said, no, there's no space between rebirth. I say, yes, there is. They say, no, there isn't. And we have big arguments. There is space between rebirths. So this is just an old argument from many hundreds of years ago, which sometimes monks, but it just doesn't make any difference. It's just such a small little argument, but we still argue about these things anyway. Yes, there is. But the only way that could actually happen the person dies and they get reborn as a two-year-old is as if they dislodge the existing stream of consciousness in that two-year-old kid. That two-year-old kid has to have some stream of consciousness in there, some being in there for those two years to survive that time. And they can actually almost like possess that person and kick the original stream of consciousness out. For example, there's this, this very weird case, but a true case, happened in Thailand, which actually shows you what can happen. There was a man died in a village, now maybe 40, 45 years of age, not that old. Remember, many years ago in Thailand, medicine was not that advanced. Actually, let alone Thailand, when I was visiting my mother, there was a case in some hospital, I think it was in Cardiff, They'd actually taken the patient down to the morgue, and before they put him in the freezer, the patient woke up again. Even the doctors, you know, only five or six years ago, could you know, misdiagnose a death. They thought they were dead, but no, they weren't. They were in some deep coma, and they woke up just in time. Imagine what that did to the people working in the morgue, frightened stiff. But they thought this person was dead. To all intents and purposes, it was dead. So they left him there and started arranging for the funeral. A few hours later, in a neighbouring village, another person died. The first person who died then woke up. And I thought, oh, they must have been diagnosed with death. But the strange thing was, when he woke up, the earlier person who died, he was speaking in a strange tone of voice. He could not recognise his surroundings. It soon became very apparent he'd woke up a different person. He was the person in the second village, the one who died just afterwards. The one who died afterwards, stream of consciousness had gone actually in to the body of this dead man. So there you were, sort of, he had a wife, he had a children. The wife could recognise his body, but could not recognise his character. And in the end, he actually went back to his other wife. The wife, who he thought was his wife, even though the wife had a husband who, a character she recognised, but in a completely different body. And he went to live with her. Strange story, but true. As if you got reincarnated, not in a new vehicle, but you got a second-hand car instead. Already been used for a few years. <laughs> not to be recommended. <laughs> But in that particular case, I'm not sure the case you're talking about, but that can happen. That two-year-old either dies or that new consciousness kicks the old one out. Can happen, but very, very rare. Does that answer the question? 
I know that there was this film apparently called, I think, The Little Buddha or something, where there was supposed to be a reincarnation of uh, into three parts, as if like the stream of consciousness split up, and you had like three reincarnations from one person. And that's completely sort of, that's just Hollywood, that's ludicrous, it can never happen. In films, maybe, but just, you know, it's a stream of consciousness is like singular, it's a series, it cannot split up into many people. Is there another question here? Yes? Yeah. Okay, asking is, uh, do people like saints, they become, who are, who are enlightened, do they get reborn again? Is there any way to get out of the cycle of rebirth? This is the whole point of the Buddha's teachings, having recognized rebirth, reincarnation, and to see just how long that goes on. Just not once, not thousand times. The Buddha came along and said, that you have cried more tears through all the times you've been incarnated than there are waters in all the oceans in the world. You know, when your girlfriend has gone off with your best friend, or when you've failed your examinations, or when a loved one has died. There'd be more bones from you than the great Himalaya mountains. It's just saying just the extent of rebirth it's not just once or ten times, thousand times, the uncountable times. So have you had enough yet? Now the point is that there are stages of enlightenment. The first stage of enlightenment when you actually really penetrate these things, not through thought or belief, but through experience in deep meditation, it's called being a stream winner. You actually see what's going on. Just like in the Matrix, you actually see what's happening. And then you've only got the most seven lifetimes left. The fully enlightened one is the last lifetime. There's no more rebirth. You're out of the cycle. So it depends on what stage of enlightenment you are. Those of you who want to keep being reborn, you can if you want. Those of you who had enough, there is a way out. And this is why we talk about the path, the Eightfold Path. Yes. If you want out, there's a pass. Does that answer your question? Yes, that's the last question. Otherwise, you know, we'd all be dead by the end of the day. I don't know. It's staying too long. <laughs> yeah, go on. Okay, where does the stream of consciousness go if there's a delay between rebirths? It goes into, for example, like ghost realms. <laughs> Many ghosts are those beings who are just, as it were, waiting for a rebirth, leaving your body, and you stay you know, in that astral ghost mind-made body. Which is why when people can see those things, and sometimes some of the ghost people see are people who have been dead for many years, sometimes hundreds of years, who still don't realize they're dead. You can call it a birth if you like, but it's not really a, a good birth as such. It's like almost like an intermediate birth. And sometimes is that case, they're not in that state for very long. And so that's why sometimes people call it like a space between, like a proper birth. Sometimes it's like you're between jobs. And when you're between jobs, I mean, you come and help with a Buddhist society. It's not really a proper job, but, you know, you're doing something. <laughs> so you know, you people actually say you're in between jobs. I should really say that it is a proper job. It's actually the only proper job <laughs> working in the Buddhist society. And so it's just sometimes just terminology there. But that's actually what we really mean by the, the between states. When you haven't, it's not the time to take a new birth yet. Be still hanging around. A lot of time it is actually to see loved ones. You've still got business to do. Don't I? Not, well, sometimes burnout karma, but a lot of times it's, I'm talking about the people who already stay a short time in that stay. It's actually to go and see their loved ones, make sure everything's okay. Most people who see ghosts are ghosts of people who just died. Oh yeah, still lots of karma to burn out, but at that particular time, most ghosts which people see are just fresh ghosts. People who just died, they just come and say hello. Say like, if I die, come and say... Lawrence, goodbye. Any more questions before I go? Mm. Yeah. I go out of business. 
Nah, I'm only joking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is actually what we do. And actually, a lot of times people who see ghosts, they see like their loved ones and just come and say goodbye. Very happy because we live in other parts of the world now. It so often happens. Not in one case, many cases. Someone like your relations are in England, they come and see you when they die. Just because they're dead over there, and just they just say, you know, bye bye. So, I'm just dead. Just say hello, goodbye. And then they might be over in the United States or somewhere, or you die over here and you've got someone in the United States, you go and say goodbye to them. Just appear there, and they see you, and they feel so wonderful. They've seen you before you go. It's actually very beautiful. Those ghost stories are just so touching. You know, my mother lives in London. It'd be great if she died and come and say goodbye. It was really nice to see you, Mum, one last time. I really respect you know what you've done, and I love you very much. And, and say goodbye. Isn't that beautiful? So that's actually what ghosts usually do. Just make sure everything is settled before they go off. And that's how why they stay in that intermediate realm for a little while. Just to finish up my untied business. Okay, no afraid for you. I'll go then. Sometimes, yes, because again, just like that gentleman over there said, sometimes in the dream, sometimes the barriers of your mind are down. And sometimes you can recall people in those dreams. However, that sometimes the dreams are not a real uh, contact. Sometimes they are imaginary. Sometimes they are real. And that's why it's so difficult actually to say through dreams whether they're real or not. Usually, just as a rule of thumb, if that dream is one very vivid and keeps repeating itself, same dream again and again, chances are it is real. But if it's just a one-off and it's not all that vivid, then maybe it could be just the imagination. But I'm talking about people who see these things with their eyes open. Okay, that's enough for tonight. You'd have to wait for your next live to hear more about reincarnation. But when you're a ghost, if you die, come and tell me, say, Ajahn Brahm, oh, you were so right, so right, so right. <laughs> and if I'm a ghost, I'm going to come and haunt you all and say, I told you so, I told you so. <laughs> okay, I'm going to do that. We can actually, uh, those of you who don't have to rush off, about three times, the Buddha Dhamma and Sangha, and then we can go and have to <laughs>